There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Well, I'm really excited, both because I'm launching a new library book vlog, and because this is the first Booktube video I'm making with my brand new microphone, and it works so well. It's probably not going to be the first one you see, but it's the first one I'm filming, so I'm very excited. So, I've done one of these before, a stack of university library books from the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, which is where I live, that I'm going to sample. Five of the seven or eight books I have for this vlog are short story collections. I'm going to read the first story in each collection, tell you about it, tell you what I think of it, and the one I like the best is the book that I'm actually going to keep and start reading immediately. The rest will go on my TBR, the ones that I'm impressed by, and the, what if I'm not so impressed, they'll just go back to the library, and the less said about those, the better. Let's get started. I'll show you the books. The first is a collection by a, a British author, Walter de la Mer, The Picnic and Other Stories. It's an old book. It used to belong to Daphne Batting in 1943. Her name, it's a gift from Irene on the 7th of April, 1943, which is about 10 days after my mother was born, right down to the year. I think it might have been published in 1941, but it is a Roman date that I can't read. I will convert that and put it at the bottom of the screen. I've never read anything that I can remember by Walter de la Mer. Let's uh, see what he's all about. I believe this is also a short story collection, but it's, it's being coy with me in its description, but I'm, I'm quite sure it is. It is called, and this is from Wales, Boys of Gold by George Brindley Evans. I have to admit, the cover illustration it caught my eye. Uh, George Brindley Evans was born in Wales in 1925. I can't pronounce the name of that town, so I'll do my due diligence later. And as of this printing, he was still with us. Well, that was in the year 2000. This is a 2001 reprint. I will verify whether he's still with us. There's some Welsh writers that have lived to be... There's, there's, I know of at least one Welsh writer who lived to be 101. Anyway, he was in the army, and then he settled down in Banwin, worked for the coal mine, lost an eye in an accident, and then became a sculptor, and a painter, and a writer. Here is a Irish short story collection, Selected Stories of Liam O'Flaherty. First published in 1937, this is a 1970 reprint, and this was a gift to the University Library by Bill Maher! Who knew? I'm sure it must be a different William J. Maher, gifted in 2005. I don't think it's that one. And here is a short story collection, the only one ever published by this writer, One of the Chosen, by Danuta Gleed, published posthumously and edited by Frances Itani, who is a Canadian novelist in her own right, and Susan Zettel. She died very young, and her husband started a, an award in her name, the Danuta Gleed Award for Best Debut Short Fiction Collection. If memory serves, that's what it's all about, and this is her one publication. She died of lupus in 1996, and she was 50. She grew up in Africa as a Polish refugee, and a lot of those places are settings in these stories, and Sharon Butala has a very long blurb on the back. This was published in 1997. This is an academic study of a very specific kind of indigenous literature literature by and about indigeneity in North America. It's called Native Removal Writing, Narratives of Peoplehood, Politics, and Law by Sabine N. Mayer. I've had it out from the library for months. I haven't so much as looked at it, but it is about the literature that was generated from this genocidal policy that white people perpetrated on indigenous people, which was removing them from their territory and putting them somewhere else or... This is a study of the literature that the, those crimes against humanity gave rise to. Speculative fiction, legal narratives, political narratives, and so on. That just sounded really interesting. And I'm going to read maybe the introduction or the first chapter just to see how heavily academic, how dense the writing is, how accessible it might be for me. This is a British gay novel I've, novella I've had out of the library forever, and I want to see if it's something worth 
reading someday or not Timothy Ireland's Who Lies Inside. This is the only thing he ever published. He's from Kent. That's not true. It is not the only thing he ever published. He has two... This was published in 1984, by which time he had two other novels published. A gay coming out novel. I think those are very important, so I want to check this. This is one that... It was the gay men's press symbol on the spine that alerted me to it as I was browsing the stacks at the University Library. And finally, this is a short story collection again that I've had out forever by a British Pakistani writer. It's called Cactus Town and Other Stories by Amer Hussein. There's the bear hardback. Here's the cover gif. And yeah, this one jumped out at me on the shelf. I can't remember why. Probably because I didn't recognize the author's name. I'm going to read probably the first story, which is called What Do You Call Those Birds? and report back. Here I go on another hopefully excellent library book, Vlog Adventure. Hey, well, here I am on the University of Saskatchewan campus. You wouldn't know it. I could be just about anywhere outside, but that's where I am. I'm sitting beside the bowl, the main kind of circle in the middle, which I showed you last time. The university has gorgeous architecture. It's, the original architecture is from my grandma's day, and they have done a really good job of most of the new buildings they have made the architectural the stone face of the buildings to resonate, if not to be exactly I like that it resonates with the old style. And so the, it's, it's one of the, I have been on many campuses in my life and this is the most beautiful. I may be a little bit partial because this is my alma mater, but I think it is a beautiful campus. So I'll show you a couple of the buildings as I'm walking out. I just went shopping. It's my sister's birthday on the 7th. I think the 7th is Friday maybe. Anyway, we're having a little party at her house so I hope I guess she'll be doing the cooking for her own party Saturday and I was just invited to that so I went to the university bookstore to get her a present and I'm not a really big spender but I'll show you what I got <laughs> she's an animal lover so I got her these silly pens look at that <laughs> it's a pen I screwed the cap off to make sure and there, what's that? That's a, a big chicken or a hen or something. And this one is a teddy bear or something. Yeah, teddy bear. Or is it a cat? That's no, a cat. She loves cats, so that's a good choice. Just a floppy, I don't, yeah. <laughs> I don't imagine she's ever gonna use them. Probably her granddaughter, my grandniece Ada, will play with them, but that's what I got her for her birthday. Woohoo! And I also got myself a present, a very, very practical present because it was such a good price. I got this uh, stapler for $13. And I've been pricing them online and I think it's for such a good one. This is a really sturdy one, very well known brand name, and uh, $2 worth of staples. So I didn't have a stapler in my Saskatoon abode and now I do. Isn't that exciting? All right. I have read the first story in this Walter de la Mer collection. The Picnic and Other Stories, and this is actually a recollection, so it's pulling kind of his best stories from other collections. So the story I read was the first one, Miss Devine, and it was originally published in his collection called The Riddle, and I can tell you when The Riddle was published. Oh, his debut collection, 1923. His debut short story collection, anyway. And this collection, The Picnic and Other Stories, was 1941. I know that because I did the conversion. You can find web pages that convent, convert Roman numerals into the kind of numbers that you and I know. And I converted it so that I could add this book to Walter de la Mare's Wikipedia page when I first signed it out from the library. Yeah, I have added about three very, very important facts and corrections to Wikipedia pages over the years. I don't know where scholarship would be without me. <laughs> Anyway, Mr. Veen, I enjoyed it. It was a story about a young boy living with his grandmother. His grandmother doesn't love him. There's a great line about that in the first paragraph. And I'm not sure how old he is, but maybe seven or eight or nine. He's the first person narrator. And this is what, uh, how we get a picture of his relationship with his grandmother who's raising him. 
for my grandmother found no particular pleasure in my company. How should she? My father and mother had married, and died, against her will, and there was nothing in me of those charms which, in fiction at any rate, swiftly soften a superannuated heart. It's probably my favorite sentence in the story. I didn't love the story, but I liked it, and I think it's going to kind of grow on me the more I sit with it. So she just kind of ignores him and leaves him to his own devices, keeps tabs on him, controls what he eats and this and that, but really within those confines lets him do his own thing. So he's really lonely. And he notices a neighbor across the way, and that's Miss Duveen. And she is at least middle-aged, perhaps even older than middle-aged. The only way I picked that up was that reference was made to her having gray hair. And she seems to be a spinster and is living with her cousin who is also a spinster or a widow or whatever. And they strike up a friendship. And Mr. Veen is really odd. And by the end, we realize probably mentally ill. But it's the only friend he's ever had. And their friendship is odd and short-lived. I don't think I need to say more about it than that, but I thought it was a, for its time, especially in 1923, it was quite a nuanced portrayal of a woman that was dealing with mental health challenges and through the perspective of a sweet young boy who by the end kind of has a coming of age realization after the conclusion of their friendship that is quite heartbreaking, actually. So it, it, it really did work for me. I don't know if this is going to be the book that I will keep and read in its entirety now, but it did impress me enough that I would seek Walter de la Mer out for other stuff. So I've read a little bit about him. His dates are 1873 to 1956. He's most famous as a children's writer and poetry, but he also was a very prolific sh short story writer for adults. Published some novels. Oh, and ghost stories. H.P. Lovecraft cited him as an inspiration for his... Which isn't saying much, because H.P. Lovecraft is the shittiest writer that the 20th century produced. But anyway, he, he was born in Kent, he married, his wife died, he, then he died. His biographical details are not particularly... Interesting. Oh, and I found out De La Mer, that does not sound British. He comes from French Huguenot stock that were, had been in, in Britain for centuries and centuries. So that is my little check-in about it. Okay, well, I just woke up from an afternoon nap after all that excitement this morning, getting downtown, not downtown, but farther down into the center of the city than I usually venture, and had a great time. I was planning to read another chunk of another book to tell you about in conjunction with this check-in, but I have run out of time because I had an extra long nap. Stay tuned. I do have a bit of a show and tell, so I'm heading off here in just a few minutes to my sister's for her birthday celebration. She's 55. She turned 55 yesterday. So I hope to vlog a little bit of that. I wanted to get some snacks, something snacky that she liked. So I asked her 14-year-old son, Michael, I sent him a secret text message and asked him confidentially what his mother likes to eat for snacks. And she, the things that he told me 
weren't things that I'd ever heard of, brands, flavors of different things. So I had to kind of hunt around and I managed to find them at a grocery store close to the used bookstore that I showed you there. And so one of the things my sister loves apparently is this brand, limited time only brand of Ruffles potato chips, KFC, original recipe chicken potato chips. I like Ruffles all dressed. I don't eat, try, try not to have any potato chips in the house, but I got her two bags of those. And Michael said she likes peanut butter M&Ms. And I went to one grocery store with my mom yesterday and they had peanut M&Ms. And I asked the cashier, have you ever heard of peanut butter M&Ms? And he said, no, I haven't. So I said, oh, probably my nephew meant peanut M&Ms. But I went, came home and Googled it. And sure enough, there are peanut butter M&Ms. So I will keep the peanut M&Ms for myself. And I picked up a bag of peanut butter M&Ms, which sound absolutely delicious. Anything with chocolate and peanut butter, I'm a fan of. And these are the pens I showed you the other day. And I do my book hauls on Patreon now, but I have to show you what I got. But first, let me tell you, how am I doing for time? So that's the bookstore. If you remember, when I first moved back to Saskatoon last year, I went to this bookstore, which I'd been going to this bookstore since I was 12 years old. It's changed locations and changed hands, and I had that really incredible experience last, I think, uh, June. It was just before I moved into this apartment. There was a huge rainstorm when I was there, and I got stuck there. I didn't mind waiting for the rain to stop, but the rain didn't stop for like 90 minutes, and so the bookstore owner offered to give me a ride anywhere I wanted to go, and so I had him give me a ride up closer to where my new apartment would be, and I wanted to go for lunch at about 3 o'clock, and so he drove me up, and had this great talk. He went back a couple months later, and he was in the middle of an intaking a huge order like a, some kid had brought all her comic books and so he was really flustered in uh, working with an adding machine and he he was in no mood to talk to me and I haven't been back so I went back today and I saw him and I said I don't know if you remember me but you gave me a ride home last summer in the rain it was very nice of you and he said oh yes um are you still teaching in Japan and I thought oh well he kind of remembers what I told him about myself but not really and I said oh no I live in Saskatoon just moved back here when we met, when we had that conversation. But he said, oh, no, no, but you were teaching on the internet. Your students in Japan, are you still doing that? And I said, oh, wow, you do remember what we talked about. So that just kind of made my day. Didn't have a time to talk to him very much, but got over all my discomfort about did he remember me or whatever. He did remember me, and I took that stack of books you saw, and he gave me $66 in store credit. So that was very generous, I thought, and I shot it all there. So... I'm just going to give you a sneak peek of the books I got. This one he didn't take. And the other bookstore didn't take it. No, I guess there's so many copies that's floating around. There's a little free library near my sister's house, so I'm going to drop it in there on the way today. And he was just bringing these in, and I said, how much are they? $2.50. My dad loves Andy Cap. He just bought pieces pants. He and his father loved them and used to read them and laugh. So... I'm going to save this because I have a book coming in the mail that's a present for Mum. That I'll combine them for a gift presentation. So for about $70, so I had to pay $4 of my own cash, this is what I got. And I'm quite pleased with that haul. And now i got to go. It's time to party. go. Hope it finds a happy home. Uh, track wow. corner, you know where Strack Corner Park is on the island? Uh, that's me driving through there. What you doing, Nita? Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? I was going to highlight my career. I'm going to drive through this provincial park with us. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you.
<laughs> we'll let you do one inside, Dolly. <laughs> Michael, help me. Michael, okay. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Well, what did you like? So I didn't think it was the first thing that came to mind. Wow. Actually. Oh, you were helping. Michael, help me. Oh, well, we can't have oh, these with peanut butter. You can't have them. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Why? It's special. It's special. Uh -huh. It's special. It's special. And just some goofy pens. <laughs> just some goofy pens. <laughs> Oh, 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 Selected short stories of Liam O'Flaherty. This is a reissue from 1970, but this selected stories was first published in the UK in 1937. Liam O'Flaherty, born in Innismore, which is on the Aran Islands in 1896, the same year of my grandma Mooney's birth, and he died in 1984 or 88, so he was quite old when he died. My grandma outlived him by uh, 11 or 12 years, and I didn't know a darn thing about him, but he he was quite an influential Irish writer in his day, known for short stories and novels. He stopped writing decades and decades. It was kind of like an E.M. Forrester figure in that way. He started, I think the last story he published was about 1948. Do I have that right? Anyway, quite early. And he was also one of the preeminent socialist writers in the English-speaking world in the first half of the 20th century. The first two stories in this book were so short that I read both of them this morning, and I loved them both. The first one is called Spring Sowing, and the second one is The Cow's Death. So they're both about rural Ireland and farming, and I'm quite partial to farms as settings for my fiction because I grew up on a farm and never really felt at home there, so I always kind of respond to it in fiction. Spring Sowing is about a newlywed couple, Martin and his wife Mary, who wake up early in the morning to break the sod on their farm. They've just been married and they're sleepy-headed and don't really want to get up so early but they're also excited to start their married life together and break the sod and plant the seeds and get started with their life. I thought it was particularly nuanced portrayal of the wife Mary because she is excited yet also kind of dreading the commitment, the obligation she senses that's going to last her entire lifetime, that she'll be, as much as she's married this man, she's married this land. Really well done. Not much happens. We get to meet the young man's grandfather, who gives them advice they don't want, that was probably very good advice. We don't get to meet his father, but there's generations of farmers in this area. It was just, is it a cliche to say that it was really earthy? Um, it made me want to read more of his fiction. The next story is basically two and a half pages, The Cow's Death, and there aren't any people in this story, but it's a very dramatic, quite moving story about a calf being stillborn and the reaction of the mother cow. And that's all I'm going to say about it, but it, I thought it was profound. So this was fantastic. Hey, well, here I am outside the branch library where I've just been reading for a couple hours. And you saw the footage of that one book. I pulled it off the new release shelf. It's called 
these particular women by Kat Meads, and it looks fascinating. I didn't sign it out because I, it's a new book, so the, it's, it's, it's only a three-week loan or something with no possibility of renewal, and I got way too much, especially with BookTube at War in July, so I put it on my list of something. I'll get it later and read it because it sounds fascinating. It has essays on Virginia Woolf, Mary McCarthy, whole bunch of female writers and about unusual perhaps unorthodox approach to various autobiographical issues in the biographies that have been published about these female writer women writers i'm not sure it just sounded really intriguing i found out that justina my subscriber and patron had it on her to be read list i'd never heard of this author cat meads but she sounds pretty interesting and the publisher sagging meniscus Sounds interesting. I do have one book about urine, an Irish novel with urine in the title that I, I was scanning their webpage and it's published by them. I haven't read it yet. A book that I'm not sure I'll ever read, but I have it on my shelf. I think Ronan Hessian re recommended it. Anyhow, I have now read, well, a spoiler alert, I didn't finish the first story in Amar Hussein's collection Cactus Town and other stories because I didn't like it. I skimmed the introduction and thought he sounded really interesting. Pakistani British writer. Writes in English but is bilingual in Urdu, English and about 17 other languages. Towards the end of his career, according to this 2002 introduction, he did start writing in his native tongue, Urdu, and publishing. But I didn't like this story. The title, it's not the title story, it's the first story. What do you call those birds? And it's about a friendship. That's a platonic friendship between a straight Pakistani woman and a straight Pakistani guy. And they are kind of attracted to each other, but it never works. They're always with other people and they become platonic friends. It just wasn't very interesting. Not because they weren't romantically involved. I wouldn't have been any less bored if they did become. It just seemed really wordy and overly stuffed with a novel's worth of detail about their relationship lives and their professional lives. And there was nothing compressed that struck me as being worthy of the form of the short story. It was just kind of an overstuffed mess. And I was disappointed because I had really high hopes for this. Maybe I should try another of the stories, but I won't. <laughs> That's the whole purpose of this vlog is to weed, weed through stuff. And this one, I'm not going to keep. I do like the epigraph, and I think I read this on the book haul, my Patreon book haul. The epigraph to this story is from a Punjabi wedding song. The waters of the ocean are pure, my friend. Remember, love will last but two days, and its pain a lifetime endure. Isn't that a cheery little epigraph? Anyhow, so that that happened. It's hot out here, and I have to go home and have lunch. I'm hungry and don't want to sit out here any longer, so that's my little check-in for today. All right, here I am on my patio. It's a little bright. I'm squinting at you, but better than filming another little update indoors. <laughs> so I have, uh, it was yesterday actually that I read the first story in this collection entitled One of the Chosen by Danuta Gleed that was published posthumously and edited by Francis Itani and Susan Zettel. They were both creative writing instructors of Danuta Gleed's and I've just read most of their in in joint introduction, which has left me all reclaimed, I must admit. But before that, yesterday, I read the first story, which was called Bones, and I thought it was a really fine story. I'm not sure that I would go so far as to say that I loved it, but I really liked it, and it's going to stick with me. And I think I'm definitely, whether it's now or later, going to continue reading this collection. Not only because of the quality of that first story, but also because of the life circumstances and the, the poor health that led to and obstructed, in both in equal measure, its creation. Danuta Glee died in 1996, and she was only... She was born in 1946, she died in 1996, I can't do that math, but she wasn't very old. She died of lupus, and she was very, very ill with it. As she was working on these stories and taking creative writing classes from Frances Itani, who is a, I would say, somewhat well-known Canadian writer, and Susan Zettel, who I've never heard of. But they loved Danuta Gleed and saw how much she was struggling just to keep body and mind together as she worked on these stories, and they edited this collection to bring it out posthumously. 
as I know I mentioned before, her husband, after her death, created a, uh, not a scholarship, but a literary prize for best debut collection of short stories published in Canada called the Danuta Gleed Prize. So, Danuta was born in what was then Rhodesia in a refugee camp as a Polish refugee, and then later grew up in Nairobi. Then her family immigrated to England, and then she married and came to Canada. So her life story is fascinating. This story, Bones, is about a young woman who shares a lot of that history. I don't think there was anything about Africa in this story, but it was a young woman, like maybe in her 20s or something, remembering herself as a young girl with her parents before her father either disappeared or took his own life. It was never really solved. His body was never found. And that's a big part of the story. And these memories are triggered when she sees a news article as a young woman the night before she's going back to fly across Canada to visit her mother and her stepfather for her mother's birthday. A news story about a man from India. He was apprehended in an airport in Tel Aviv because he had a skeleton in his luggage. It was his dad's bones and he wanted to get them somewhere to bury them and he was arrested. His fall play was neither ruled out or ruled in but that triggered the memory of the fact that our protagonist's father disappeared and he was a displaced person. Presumably Polish but it wasn't specified. The marriage between this young girl's parents was on the rocks and then he killed himself or disappeared. And she's never really been able to accept that he's dead because his body was never found. So hence the title, Bones. And I thought it was really quite affecting and well written. And now that I know more about Danuta Gleed's story and how desperately ill she was as she did her best to finish this these stories, I would be willing to judge them and experience them on a different level. I didn't know all that when I read this story yesterday, and I thought it was a very fine story, but I found the introduction where they just talked about her grit, her determination, and how just terribly unwell she was at the end of her life, and the labor of love for these two Canadian writers and creative writing instructors took it on to get this book into print. It, it removes me. I, I feel like Alfred Klemp is. I'm telling you about it. So yeah, this is one I'm going to read for all of those reasons. I am delighted to tell you about this next book that I previewed. This is a collection of short fiction from a Welsh writer, Boys of Gold, by George Brinley Evans. That's what he looked like back in the day. He died last year, October, age 96, and this was published in 2000. He's from Banwin, born in 1925, so he was exactly 75 when this was published. He was a collier. He served in Burma during the war. Second World War, and I didn't read his obituary line by line, but I read enough of it to get the gist of his life, which sounds absolutely fascinating. He didn't start writing until he was in maybe late middle age, after his wife died. So I went into this, again, feeling a little skeptical, and uh, I was totally seduced by the first story. It's the title story, Boys of Gold. It's obviously heavily autobiographical. It opens with him as a soldier in... Burma, but the bulk of it is a childhood remembrance which just charmed the pants off me of him going with his older brother and a bunch of other people up this tall mountain. It's named here, but I won't be able to pronounce it. That is steeped in Welsh history to pick windberries, which is a European blackberry. It, I don't know what it's called in other parts of Europe, but in Wales, apparently, it's called a windberry, but it seems to me like it's a basic blueberry and it's just so affecting there's an eccentric scotsman who lives up on the mountain and he's the one that sells the licenses for him that you have to buy in order to pick the berries and our protagonist is only seven his older brother is helping him quite a bit and the protagonist is barely able to pick he doesn't even cover the bottom of his windberry picking pail they're walking an ancient road that was built on the orders of Emperor Maximus, the road along which St. Patrick was led to slavery by Irish raiders from his home at Banwin. 
So one of the things that George Brindley Evans was involved with near the end of his life was trying to get his little town, Banwin, declared the birthplace or the home of St. Patrick. I didn't ascertain whether he was successful. And then up on the mountain, they, they come upon the Roman wall. They are swept up in climbing it and even trying to carve their name in it. That's all I'm going to say about it, other than that there was a reference to the laws of Berai Switch, and I'm going to spell it because it's a Welsh name that I, and I couldn't find anything on Google. The only reference to this word on Google comes from this book. This was a custom that designated territorial rights to the picker already on the spot. <laughs> took me back to my days of picking Saskatoon berries and, and what else, choke cherries around rural Saskatchewan. And then it goes be circles back to a really violent incident in the war that I'm not going to talk about. It's actually quite grotesque in a sentence or two. And the connection he makes to his innocent childhood self and the look that his mother gives him after... Well, what happens? It's so adorable. His older brother just merges the berries from his pail and his and this young seven-year-old kid's pail and says, "This is what we came up with, Mom. This is, we picked this together." And the mother gave them both a look of pride, as only a mother could. And then that memory is juxtaposed with the killing of soldiers in Burma, every one of whom had a mother who doted on them. It's really quite powerful. Probably I'm going to buy my own copy because I already love it. I think I'm going to save it for Debathon next year. I might not be able to. I just loved it. I really, really loved it. All right, if you can hear the little girl crying. She's, I thought she was crying out to, to me. She's looking out the second floor bedroom over there. But her daddy just came across with his work back on his way home from work. And so she was calling out to daddy. So I think the, the crying out is at an end. I have now skimmed the introduction to Native Removal Writing, this academic book about that, subtitled Narratives of Peoplehood, Politics, and Law. It's not a book that's going to be for me, although there were things that I read in the introduction that were of interest, but no, I want to read the, the novels. This is an academic study of Native Removal, which is the term used for one genocidal tool that settler North Americans have used to get indigenous peoples the hell out of their way, no matter what the cost. Displacing them and shipping them off to another part of, of the continent. The most famous example, but only one of many in the States, is the Trail of Tears, the Cherokee removal from some southeastern states into Oklahoma, with just genocidal repercussions for the Cherokee. But Canada has umpteen examples too. I have decided after reading parts of the introduction and skimming other parts that I want to read a standard history of these acts of genocide, but I don't want to read this book. Have I said the author's name? Sabine Meyer. She's taking an interesting approach. It's a work of literary criticism and cultural theory based on both fictional and non-fictional representations of native removal. But I don't need to read this uh, academic theoretical text about all that, analyzing it, or at least not yet. All right, well, I'm in Broadway. I'm in the Broadway neighborhood, which is one of my favorite parts of Saskatoon, and I've never put it on a vlog because I don't get that far away from home very often. But I'm going to show you a little bit of Broadway today, and I'm going to start with one of my favorite bookstores across the street there. I don't know if you have, well, you can see the sign. It's called Turning the Tide, and it's a very lefty, progressive bookstore. They've got a great fiction section, indigenous, queer section, everything. And I ordered a book for my Women in Translation Month TBR that has come in. So I'm off to pick it up. I love the wallpaper in the hallway here. Hello. I have a 
have a book that I ordered that has come in. Oh, Sean one. Mooney. Sean Mooney. <clears throat> so I've had a, um, my booktube channel for six years. Oh wow. Well. Yeah, and uh, I started it when I was living in Tokyo. I'm born and raised in Saskatchewan, but I lived in Tokyo for almost 15 years. Fortunately, I tried this place a couple weeks ago. They have ramen and it was awful. So disappointing. Right before I mount you on the tripod, let's show you where I'm sitting. That's Broadway behind me. Sitting on a lovely little bench out here, and this is the probably 100 plus year old building. That's the cafe I just came out of. All right, let's see how this little mic with the wind protector thing on it does with the wind because suddenly there's a gust of wind. I think this is the final book for this v, this university library vlog and that is this queer novel from the UK, Timothy Ireland's Who Lies Inside, published by Gay Men's Press in 1984. And I really had almost zero hopes that this would be anything that I would be interested in reading. I loved I loved what I read. I read about eight pages, and I just I knew that I was so into it that I didn't need to read any more. I'm going to be reading this one. I don't know when, but it's a short little no novel, and it's a coming out novel. Timothy Ireland is a British novelist. He looked rather handsome back in the day, and this is a really touching coming out story. The first person protagonist is on the high school rugby team in the UK, wherever wherever it is in the UK. He's Martin. He's playing a match. And he has an awakening in the middle of this match at the end of the season with another team in another school. And he, I don't know if it's, it might be a slight exaggeration, but basically he falls in love with a beautiful boy on the other team. And he'd never really thought of himself as having any queer desires until that moment, which that makes me skeptical just because I don't think men are built that way. Like, but there's also a diversity even within men. Men are pretty predictable, but there, there must be some men who are more like, like, I know of lots of women who say that they didn't uh, develop or become aware of any attractions to other women. 
until uh, midlife or, or so on, that, that women's sexuality is different than men's sexuality. But also, there must be men who have experiences similar to Martin here, who at the age of 17 or 18 or something, suddenly feels erotically and romantically attracted to uh, a man of his own age for the first time in his life. Anyway, it's so well written and it's so emotionally compelling. In eight or nine pages, I already have a very clear picture of his relationship with both of his parents and the instant attraction between this two was really vivid and made me smile and made me feel things, feel tender and nostalgic for, the, for my similar experiences, although I was certainly aware of the impulse at a much younger age, but just really sweet and well done. I don't think I need to say any more than that. And now I'm going to take you across the street. Can you see the Bulk Cheese Warehouse? That is where my old friend Glenn worked for years. That cheese deli, deli place has been there since the 80s, probably long before the 80s. Glenn is my famous friend who gave me the line, Coffee Thursday! <laughs> he worked there for years. Coffee Thursday is on the back of the, pa the Patreon bookmark that you get because it's such a kind of famous story about me. One of my famous expressions that comes directly from Glenn. And uh, so I'm, I feel nostalgic every time I go there. So I'm going there to pick up some stuff for lunch and maybe for sandwiches or whatever for the week. And so I'm gonna take you there and then go home. So, this is for you, Mom. What have you got here? Oh, the book! You got Kim! Oh, ho, ho. wow! <laughs> nice. Oh, my gosh! Oh, <laughs> it's the little book that we had at school. And then yeah. the funny thing is, I had ordered you a copy, and I wasn't paying attention, so here's another one. It's The Jungle Book <laughs> by the same author. I thought it was Kim, and it came in the mail. Came, okay. and I was like, oh, that's not oh, Kim. Wow. The Jungle Book was made into a Disney movie. Yes. Kim is quite lovely, isn't it? Isn't it yeah. lovely? It is, it is. Yeah. Yeah. I am Kim, I am Kim, and what is Kim? His soul repeated it again and again. And it's hard to get a book for Dad, but I did get one. <laughs> uh, oh. What have you got? An Andy, an Andy cap. Oh, quiet, please. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>